Uh, today I want to talk about three really exciting 17th century sites that I've been exploring in the towns of Glastonbury and Windsor, Connecticut. These sites are providing really interesting new information about day-to-day -day life uh, during the 17th century by some of the first English settlers of the Connecticut River Valley. This is a period of time we don't actually know very much about. Very, very little archaeology has happened in Connecticut, so this is all very exciting and new stuff. All three sites were, used, or were found using ground-penetrating radar, a technology that literally allows us to see under the ground and find secrets that have been buried, in this case, for centuries. So ground-penetrating radar is not actually very new technology. You could buy a ground penetrating radar unit back in the 1970s. And in the mid 80s, we had a group uh, come out and explore the Revolutionary War site um, at Fort Griswold in Groton. And you can see here the guy lugging around a pretty heavy instrument, and he's cabled to the back of his van where a lot of the instruments are located. So things have gotten a little bit easier, as you'll see in some of the later slides. But basically, the technology's been around for a while. Um, ground penetrating radar works in a nutshell by sending high frequency radio waves into the ground which bounce back differentially based on subtle changes in soil um, and often this is things like moisture levels that affect the electrical resistivity of the ground. We don't have to worry about the details of that much. Now ground penetrating radar does not see tiny objects in the ground very well. But it is pretty good at seeing large-scale areas of disturbance, and often these things can be caused by human beings when they're digging things, building houses, and activities like that. Now, ground-penetrating radar is uh, commonly used in cemetery sites. And one of the things I was kind of first surprised by when I started my job as the state archaeologist in 2014 was uh, the number of questions I got about cemeteries and people asking for help finding unmarked burials. So this is when I met Debbie Sarabian, the state soil scientist. You can see Debbie right there on the left. Debbie had been working with a prior state archaeologist for many years doing similar radar surveys. And basically, it was on these cemetery surveys that I got to know Debbie. And I started asking myself why we weren't using radar like this on more truly archaeological sites. Now, one of my first goals was to investigate the Windsor Palisade. This was a large fortification built around the center of Old Windsor, which was settled around 1635. And this palisade was built to protect its inhabitants during the Pequot War that came shortly after that. Now, for decades, historians and archaeologists have been really curious about the exact location of this fortification, despite the fact that it actually was very well documented in the 1600s by Matthew Grant, uh, one of the town clerks and a land surveyor. Um, and its general location in space was known because it wasn't a mystery. It was located at the end of Palisado Avenue. Um, I was convinced that with radar, we could go out there and in a short matter of time, find clear evidence of the run of this fortification wall. However, everywhere Debbie and I checked, we failed to find any evidence of this thing. However. The southeastern corner of the Palisado area did produce a very strange anomaly in the ground. This was basically a rectangular signature that Debbie identified. It was like six feet deep and 18 feet across. Um, and we realized this was probably a filled in house cellar that was no longer visible at all on the surface. We were basically in someone's backyard. It was a lovely green yard, nothing to see. Um, because of that, we said, well, let's shift our investigations over to this site. We started doing some excavation there. And we found bits of you know, broken brick, not too exciting, broken window glass. But then we started getting things like clay pipes and ceramics that were more datable, and realizing uh, we were getting artifacts from the 1600s and very early 1700s. So this was kind of an important site, one that really hadn't been found in town yet. Um, Therefore, I went over to the Windsor Historical Society. We dug into the local land records a little bit more, and we soon realized that this was actually the house lot of Captain John Mason. Now, Mason is not really a household name anymore, but back in the 1600s, he was one of Connecticut's leading men. He was in charge of the Connecticut colonial militia, and he was actually the one who led the raid uh, on the Pequot village at Mystic that resulted in the deaths of hundreds of Native people. So he's an important historical figure, and he's also a very controversial one. So finding his actual house site 
was pretty freaking amazing, right? Uh, this was great, but we didn't really want to stop there. We continued using radar to search for additional sites. We very successfully just uh, identified the house site of Francis Stiles at the north end of town, and Stiles was one of Windsor's founding fathers, basically, one of the very first inhabitants of the town, who sent there to help set up for the lords and gentlemen who were to follow him. Um, but even more important, we found a remarkable, huge farm complex in South Glastonbury. So the Hollister site is located in a beautiful horse pasture down by the Connecticut River. And there's nothing at the surface that would provide any evidence that there is anything of any interest or uh, you know, importance hidden underneath the grass out there. But I was appro approached by the Glastonbury Historical Society and one of the Hollister descendants who actually owns the property still to do an investigation to see if we couldn't find this site somewhere in this big horse pasture. Um, as the date was approaching that I was supposed to run a sort of public archaeology dig for people in town, I got anxious and I, I, I called a UConn grad student I knew who was also a GPR technician and said, hey Peter, his name is Peter Leach, can you come out to the site like the day before, run a little radar, let's see if we can find somewhere to start this excavation. Obligingly, Peter came out, started doing radar, and immediately started finding all sorts of features. Now his, his radar produced, in the end, a huge map. What we're seeing here is something the size of a football field, so you have the scale. And it does not take an expert to start seeing that there's very interesting features popping up in the soil. So you see these big rectangles? These are all house cellars. There's a well here. We're at the surface again, diving down 10 centimeters at a time, and a, a fourth large cellar feature over here, and lots of weird pits and odd objects and things like that. Peter was actually blown away by this. Despite the fact that he'd been doing radar surveys for a very long time, this was kind of one of the most amazing things he'd found. It turns out the soils at this site are just so conducive to radar work uh, that it's just in an ideal setting. Now, Peter's work was followed up on uh, two years ago by two students from the University of Denver, Maeve Herrick and Jasmine Saxon. They built on Peter's grid and went over a much larger area and can have continued to find evidence of additional features, another house cellar, and probably most remarkably, three very likely Native American house floors at the south end of the site. Okay, in the two years that we've had to start investigating the contents of some of these cellars, we have found some pretty remarkable finds. On the left is a piece of North Italian marbleized, slip-decorated earthenware. This is very fancy stuff and frankly only shows up on really the wealthiest households even in Europe. It's very rarely found in the New World at all. It tells us something about the status of the Hollister family and their access to these items is sort of uh, very high quality. It's likely that this was an heirloomed piece that was passed through the family for a couple generations because this stuff is usually manufactured between about 1600 and 1650. And we know the farm probably was not inhabited until after about 1640 and was abandoned about 1711. Now we also found a remarkable amount of really well-preserved animal and food remains, basically. These tell us a lot about the English diet of the Hollister family at the site. We see traditional farm animals and uh, farmed crops that one might see in Europe. But we have also a remarkable number of hunted and fished game, shellfish, um, and also gathered fruit remains, things that we would more typically see on a Native American site. So this is providing evidence that these first English inhabitants of the Connecticut River Valley were sort of hybridizing their diet, taking advantage of crops and uh, hunted food used by Native American people that they were now the neighbors of, and incorporating them into their diet. This is really one of the first cases we're seeing such strong evidence of this. In addition to that, on the right, this is Maeve Herrick, one of our GPR experts out there from Denver. She's holding a huge Native American pot sherd. Now, we found hundreds of pottery sherds in the English cellars at this site that provide clear evidence that the Hollister family members were incorporating Native American pottery into their normal kind of household goods, and that these pots eventually broke and were discarded and dumped into these cellars when the house was abandoned, along with all the European wares that they had as well. All of these things are, together are telling us uh, about a much more complex story of the interactions between the Hollister family and their Wangunk neighbors. 
And on top of that, the existence of these three native house floors at the south end of the site, one of which we determined this summer to date to the exact period as the rest of the house, we know they're not hundreds of years earlier, for example, they tell us that in many cases, these English families may have had much more complex and interesting relationships with, the, with their uh, native neighbors than we usually consider. We usually sort of think of the hostilities, but in this case, we have very clear evidence of sort of very close relationships. It is likely that this a native family, or more than one native family, was living on the farm, perhaps working for the Hollisters, and through that rea uh, relationship had direct access to European goods that they were really interested in. Okay, so before I end, I wanna just share this one short video. It's like a one minute clip of one of the moments of discovery working in the south cellar that Maeve and Jasmine located in their radar. This is one we just did last August. All right, we're gonna uh, remove this really interesting jug fragment. It's probably not much bigger than uh, what we can see here, but I've got Lee working on it. We're gonna kind of go around the edges gently until it starts to wiggle. Uh, but I thought this would be kind of a fun moment to share. Okay, starting to wiggle. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think there's too much of it left if we're this close yeah. to the floor. That's it. What you see is what you get. Yeah, yeah, there she goes. There you go. Nice. Now, why don't you hold it up right there? Yep, Oop, a little close. Let's see. Let's turn it over. And yeah, nice we have this lovely. The glaze on the interior too. There's our profile on our jug handle. Let's sort of brush that off a little. Yeah, that is a nice fragment. Super. And yeah, we have so much of this stuff that it's likely going to go back together. Interesting kind of earthenware, almost in the shape of a Bellarmine jar, but I think this is an English made pot. That's what we do this for, right? It's those kind of moments that are really precious, even to someone as jaded as I am and who's been digging a little bit too long. Um, so just to wrap up, I'd love to say that this old technology of ground penetrating radar has allowed us to discover sites that we thought either no longer existed or were simply too hard to find. In fact, just no one in the last hundred years in Connecticut has really been doing much research in this direction. So we've been able to show just in the last three years that these sites are out there, that some of them are remarkably well preserved, and that using the right tools, we can definitely find them. So ground penetrating radar is really allowing us to see beneath the surface in a very literal way um, and uncover secrets that have been hidden for hundreds of years in the Connecticut River Valley. Thanks very much.